Hello, my friends. I'm Tyrone Holcomb, and I'm the host who loves to bring you close. And of course, I'm talking about bringing you closer and closer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the way that I'm able to do that is through this podcast that I call Points to Ponder. And you know I love to remind you that it is your points to ponder. And therefore, I am excited and delighted that you once again have decided to join in with me to hear a word, not from a man, but to hear a word from the Lord. And so I'm so thankful that you're trusting me to study God's word and to bring his word to you, to encourage you and inspire you through the rest of your week. You know, I have a new series that I want to embark upon. And the title of this series is, Who is God? That's right. I want to talk about who is God. And in particular, who is God to you? You can walk into a room, and if you ask who is God, I'm sure that just about everybody in that room would give you a different answer. You have those of us who believe in the God of Israel, the living God, the one and only true God, the God that's a part of the Trinity, that is God the Father, God the Son, who is Jesus Christ, and then God the Holy Spirit, that's the Trinity. That's the God that we have come to know and to trust and to love. But you have so many different religions and so many people who uh, give their love and their devotion to just about all kinds of gods. And so I want us to go into the scriptures and find the account where Paul, he had to address this very issue. Who is God? Now, why do I want to discuss that point in particular? Well, if you know who God is, then you won't worry about the cares of this world. But too many people, and I'm talking about the people of God, the believers, too many of God's children, they're frustrated, disillusioned, and hard to get along with because of all the various cares and issues that they face in life. And that would not be the case if they knew who God was. Let me go over to Acts chapter 17. I want to read verses 22 through 23 to begin with, and I'm coming from the New International Version of the Bible, and this is what it reads. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus uh, and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. Wow. Paul, he went to Greece and in particular in Athens and he was speaking to the Greeks there. And he said, I perceive that you are very religious. And that's the people that this points to ponder is directed to. I'm not talking to the unbeliever. If the unbeliever or the unsaved happens to see this program and they receive God, well, praise the Lord. I'm happy for that. But I want to direct this particular points to ponder to the people of God. Paul said, I perceive that you are very religious. He says, in fact, I walked around the city and I saw many objects of worship. He says, but then I saw a particular object with the inscription on it to the unknown God. And that's what I want to talk to you all about. And that's what God placed on my heart this evening to come and talk to you all about. They had a, a, an inscription that read the unknown God. In essence, the Greeks, they believed in the God of just about everything. But just in case they missed a God, they wrote into the unknown God. And we live in a society today 
that we have a melting pot of religions. We have people that believe in all kinds of gods and deities, but I'm talking about the one true and living God. Paul says, let me talk to you about this unknown God that you all don't have any clue to who he is. Now, what I'm saying to the believers, I'm not saying that you don't have a clue of who God is, but what I want to say is oftentimes we forget about the greatness of our God, and therefore we allow the problems, the pain, and the pressures of this world to overtake us, and we become overwhelmed. And so what I want to talk about is who is God? Pause for a moment and think about who is God? Do you know what God wants more than anything from you and I? Is he wants us to know him. That's what God is looking for. Jesus asked his disciples, whom do men say that I am? And his disciples says, well, some are saying that you are Elijah and some are saying you're John the Baptist. Some are saying that you are Jeremiah or maybe just one of the prophets. And then Jesus says, okay, that's what the some are saying. But now who do you say? that I am. And that's what this series, beloved, is all about. We know what some are saying about God, but who do you say that God is? Who is God to you? Listen to Acts chapter 17, verses 27 through 28. Again, the NIV. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he is not far from any of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own prophets have said, we are his offspring. Paul was saying that when God created man, he gave man boundaries and he gave man limitations for what reason he says so that man would then seek God so that man would search for God and in their searching they would discover God is not far from them in fact it's in him that we live we move and we have our very being. And what Paul was doing, he was quoting when he used that phrase, one of their own Greek philosophers. Paul says, as many of uh, certain poets of yours have said that we are his offspring. We are God's offspring, beloved. And he wants you to know that he is near. Not only does God care, but he is near. If you would reach for God, search for God, you would discover he's not as far as you think that he is. You know, God gave us his Bible because he wanted us to have a, a record, if you would, of his reality and then his history. And what I mean by history is how he conducted himself with man throughout history. God has always been concerned with his creation, that is humanity. And so God gave us the Bible so that we could use his word just to get to know him better. If you don't know who God is, I dare to say it's because you have not really been seeking and searching in his word. Jesus was challenged by the devil on one account. And the devil said, if you are the son of God, Command that these bread be, or these stones be made to bread. In other words, the devil was saying, if you're God's son, why would you settle for stones when you can have bread? God is asking many of his children, I mean, the devil rather, is asking many of God's children that very same question today. What question is that? If you are God's child, why are you going through hardship? The stones, stones are hard. And the devil wants to know, and he wants you to ponder. If you're God's son, if you're God's daughter, then why all the problems in your life? He wants you to start to doubt God's love for you. And if you don't want to doubt God's love, you may doubt his reality altogether. Some philosophers have said, 
God doesn't exist because if he existed, we wouldn't have all the problems in this world that we have. Other philosophers have said, like Nietzsche, that God is dead. Well, I want you to know they're all wrong because God is alive and God is real, my friends. And so the devil, he challenged Jesus on the base of if God is real, why the stones? Well, why don't you go ahead and turn them into bread? That is, feed your appetites. Give in to your lusts and your desires. And what did Jesus say? Jesus told the devil, man shall not live by bread alone. Now, I love the fact that he used alone. He didn't say man shall not live by bread at all <laughs> because, my Lord, we all need to eat, right? He says man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. My friends, when you open up your Bible, God opens up his mouth. And so when you want to hear from God, if you're struggling to receive a word from God, it's because you're not opening up that book. If you open up God's Bible and then ask God by his spirit, to reveal to you who he is in the word. He'll do that. That's what happened when Jesus was on the road to Emmaus. The Bible says that he hacked upon two disciples and they were distraught because they felt that Jesus had died. And they knew that he was crucified on the cross and they thought he, that was it. He was dead. And so these disciples, they were traveling on the road and they were depressed. And Jesus came up on them and began to talk to them. And they didn't recognize the Lord. And the Bible says he took their word from them. And he began to open up the word of God and point and show to them uh, through history all the places where it was written of him. And the Bible said that when by the time he got finished reading that word and showing them in history who he was, he says in the volume of the book, it was written of me. By the time he got through with that, he was at their house and they began to partake of a meal. And Jesus broke the bread and he blessed it and gave it to him. And right then and there, they realized they was with the Lord. What am I saying? See, Jesus will reveal himself to you, my friends, when you go into the Holy Writ, when you go into the Bible and you read it. And as you read it, the Holy Spirit will reveal it to you and show you Jesus in your life. Whatever you need from God, you will find it as you go into his word. Now, as we go back to the account in Acts chapter 17 with Paul, Paul was speaking to these Greeks and he was trying to convince them and convey to them that God is real. And he was speaking to them of the unknown God as they put it. And so Paul, he had two different kinds of people that he had to speak to. And the reason why I bring this out is because the two kinds of people that Paul had to speak to then is the two kinds of people that I have to speak to every week on the points to ponder. Now, the first kind of people was the Epicureans. The Bible calls them the Epicureans and the Epicureans. These were people who followed the pleasure principle and by pleasure principle, they believed in enjoying life. They followed their feelings and you got people today like the Epicureans. They believe in pleasure. And all they look for is to have a good time. Some people, and again, I'm not talking about the unbelievers. I'm talking about God's people. Some of God's people, they would rather be entertained than to be edified. See, a program like this, the points to ponder, a lot of folks don't tune into it. Why? Because I'm not on here with a lot of gimmicks and games, and I'm not trying to entertain you. And therefore, they'll rather go to other social media sites where there's gossip, where there's a whole lot of fussing and fighting and carrying on. Well, that was the Epicureans. They were into whatever pleased them, whatever gave them a sense of joy. They were always caught up in their feelings. But now, Paul also had another 
type of people that he was speaking to. And the Bible records that their name was the Stoics. Now, the Stoics, they believed in the pain principle. They also believed in enduring life. And they taught you must control your feelings. So the Stoics, they were not given to emotions. They were given to their disciplines. They believed that if you were going to be saved, you were going to be saved by your own conduct and your own character. So here Paul, he's speaking to the Epicureans who wanted to enjoy life and the Stoics who wanted to endure life. And Paul I believe over in another account in Philippians, he brought these two groups or schools of thoughts together when he said over in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 10 through 11, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participate in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. See, when Paul says, I want to know Jesus in the power of his resurrection. See, that was the Epicureans. They, they wanted to have excitement. So they were tuned into something like that, knowing God in the power of his resurrection. But then he says, but I also want to know him in the fellowship of his sufferings. That was the Stoics. Remember, they believed in enduring life and going through life appreciating the pains. And so Paul says, but now I want to bring you two schools of thoughts together for this purpose, that we would attain the resurrection of the dead. There is life after death. That's why Paul wanted to know him. Not only was Paul talking to two groups of people when he was talking to the Greeks, but Paul also had to get through three things that hindered them from receiving the word that he was delivering. He had to get beyond these three hindrances. And this is what, again, we have to get beyond today. The first hindrance was idolatry. Remember, I told you the Greeks had all kinds of gods. They believed in many gods. But here's the problem. Their gods could care less about the affairs of men. And the Greeks, they wanted to worship all these different gods, but they didn't have any gods who cared about them. But that's not the case with us. God does not want us to be given to idolatry where we have all kinds of gods, but God wants us to know him. Who is God? He's the one true and living God. And he cares about the affairs of you, beloved. God, he cares about you. He so much cares about you. The Bible says that he's taken the time out to number the hairs on your head. That's profound. It didn't say he's counted the hairs on your head, but rather he's numbered the hairs on your head. So therefore, if he's numbered the hairs on your head, when a hair falls to the ground, God can say that was number 33. He's taken the time out to number the very hairs on your head. And then whenever you are in pain and you begin to have sorrow in your heart, the Bible says he captures your tears in a bottle. See, we are not given to idolatry because the God that we serve, the one true living God, he loves us profoundly. And the other hindrance that the Greeks struggled with when Paul was delivering this message was novelty. When I say novelty, they were looking always for something new. That's what the scriptures tells us in Acts 17. It says that they always, they spent their days sitting around trying to discuss and discover something new. And you got people that's like that today. You can't hold their attention. They feel like, oh, I already know God. You know, I've heard all of this before. Give me something new. Give me a, a story, a revelation. Give me a new account. But here's the problem with people who are always searching for something new. They don't truly appreciate the old. The Bible says, 
Remove not the old landmarks that your fathers have established. See, we need some old landmarks that serves as protectors and boundaries for us so that we don't go too far off the, uh, the edge of life, if you would. We need landmarks that help us and that establish us. This is why we need principles in life. I'm talking about proven uh, principles that help govern how we live. We need the old. To always want the new, it would be like being a tree and always sprouting new branches. But the only way you can sprout new branches is you need old roots. See, if you remove the old roots, the tree dies. So every spring, when we see new branches come on the tree and new flowers come on the tree, that we can only appreciate the new because we have the old, because that tree has roots and that's what we need. And so we should not be given into the novelties all the time when it comes to God, especially when it comes to God. But then the third hindrance for them was philosophy. See, the Greeks were high on philosophy. You know, they had uh, philosophers like Aristotle, you know, and they, and they believed in uh, these philosophers and all of their philosophies, and they appreciated the philosophies. But here's the issue with philosophies. Philosophies, when you really boil it down to, it's the thoughts of man. And we don't need the thoughts of man. What we need are God's thoughts. God says in his word, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And because his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, then we need to come up and rise to the level of God's thoughts. So we have to make sure that when we're hearing a word, that we're cognizant of the hindrances of idolatry and novelty as well as philosophy. And don't allow those things to become hindrances to you, my brother and my sister. See, when Paul went and spoke to the Greeks and he began to share his teachings about God, they had no problem. They was really interested in what he had to say until he came to the point concerning Jesus. And when he got to Jesus and began to share with them how Jesus was the son of God, how Jesus is God himself, and how Jesus died and rose again for us to be saved. Many of them said, we, we can't believe that. We can't, we can't receive that. Why? Number one, they had really a hard time believing that God would come near, that God would get involved with humanity that way. And many of God's people today, they won't always openly admit it, but they have fears. And the reason why they have fears is because they don't believe God will come near. But I'm here to tell you, God, he still comes near. You know, I had a cousin, or I still do have a cousin. Her name is Donna. I love her dearly. I've been living in Texas for three decades now. And at the time I was in Texas for over 20 years. And I had been trying to get family to come from my native city and state, which is Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I had been trying to get them to come up and visit me in Texas. And they just wouldn't come, you know, for whatever reasons, they would not come. And then one particular time I was talking to my cousin Donna and she revealed to me that she was a Dallas Cowboy fan. Go figure. I couldn't understand how she lives in Philadelphia and became a Dallas Cowboy fan. But she told me she's a Dallas Cowboy fan. And I said to her, I said, well, you know, I go to the Dallas Cowboy games every year. And she was amazed to hear that. And do you know what Donna did? Donna got on an airplane and she came all the way to Texas for the first and only time to see me because she wanted to see the Dallas Cowboys. Now, I was happy to see her, but then I had to say, wow, it took the Dallas Cowboys 
to get her to come near. I'm here to tell you, my friend, God, he came near. And he didn't come near because of your association with someone else. He didn't come near because of some possessions that you had. He did not come near for any other reason than his love for you. God will come near, my friends. And then the other reason that the Greeks struggled with Paul's summation is they said, wait a minute. God died and then he rose again? And many of them said, we can't believe that. And, and many of God's people, they struggle with that now. You know, God, I believe that you died and rose again, but I believe that was a one-time account. And, and God wants you to know, no, he sent Jesus as an example to show that there is life after death and that he has the power to resurrect the dead. And you may feel like something right now in your life, it's dead, it's over. But God wants you to know that there is life after death. The point that I want you to really ponder all this week is who is God? Is he like the unknown God that the Greeks believed in? Or do you know God? Jesus said, who do men say that I am? And then he asked, who do you say that I am? My friends, if you know who God is in your life, I mean, really know him, know him in his power, then you won't worry about the problems that you're facing right now because you know that God has power and he has you in his heart. I pray that this word has been a blessing to you. And I'm asking that you would share this word with your family as well as with your friends. And if you have not subscribed to this channel, go ahead and click that subscribe button and then also hit that notification bell so that you would be no excuse me, notified of future content that I would put up on YouTube. Uh, there's a number that's on your screen. If you would like to call for counsel or have a prayer request, you can call and, and, and I would contact you. That's right, I would contact you and pray with you. And if you need counsel, I'm willing to do that as well. Well, my friends, I'm praying that for the rest of this week, you remain safe and confident in this very fact. God is real. God bless. We love you.